welcome to 2023 with Agnes Kunkel. In 2020, the world was hit by COVID-19. It was like a time machine. Find out what the world might look like in spring 2023 and how we will need to adapt. 2023, your window to a world beyond COVID-19. Every morning, Daniel leaves the house for a run. His life as a doctor is quite stressful, so he takes this time to free his mind and recharge. But today, he is having some flashbacks from his time working in the emergency room for COVID-19 patients back in 2020. Daniel still experiences a lot of moral distress and guilt for not having been able to save all his patients. Now in 2020, he is working as a general practitioner. After the pandemic, it was crucial to make mental health care available to all people, and Daniel got intensely trained for the treatment of post-traumatic and adjustment disorders as a mandatory part of his profession. Daniel has to hurry to his 8am appointment with Anna. During the time of social distancing and curfews, she experienced a high level of emotional stress and anxiety out of fear to contract and spread the virus. Usually, people adjust to changes within a few months, but Anna continues to have emotional and behavioural reactions. She is perceiving the world as a dangerous place and avoids activities and travelling. And there is Max, Daniel's 8.30am appointment. He lost his job during the pandemic and got replaced by an automated system, working more efficiently on his role. This heavily affected Max's self-esteem and daily mood. Daniel noticed sleeping problems and increased misuse of alcohol in his patient. Today, Daniel uses his online conference system to provide clinical services to Anna and Max. In this way, frequent follow-up visits, management of chronic conditions, medication management, and professional consultation provided remotely via video connections are easily possible. Daniel is trained to maintain an empathetic posture when he is confronted with the fears and stress of his patients and always ensures a healthy climate of communication and trust between him and the patient in order to explain that fear, anxiety and sadness are normal symptoms after a pandemic and can be treated. Hello, I'm Agnes Kunkel, your host in 2023 your window to the world beyond COVID-19. Today, we have nearly 16.3 million confirmed cases worldwide and nearly 650,000 people have confirmed to have died from COVID-19. Actual hotspots are still the United States, Brazil, India and South Africa. Many countries around the world are afraid of some sort of second wave. Today is 27th of July, 2020. Our guest today is Sarah Baxter from Chicago. Sarah is the founder of MHC, Mental Health Coaching and Consulting. Dear Sarah, you have been helping many people from different ages, situations and cultures with different mental health issues, including anxiety, depression and other mental health concerns over a decade. Surely the recent changes in the world have also reached you and brought you cases with different diagnoses that were triggered by this epidemic experience. Hello, Sarah. Welcome to our podcast. Hello, Agnes, and hello, everybody listening. It's great to be here. Yeah, hello. It's really great to have a chance to talk to a medical expert. I guess you can give us some insight what you have doing in the recent years and maybe how the lockdown or the restrictions have affected your work? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so I started in mental health when I went to university and I did a psychology degree um, and then went and worked as a support worker after that mm. for a few years. Really fell in love with mental health from a very, very young age. I used to read the kind of child called It, mm -hmm. Tori Hayden, mm -hmm. those style books. Always always had a fascination with mental health and mental well-being um, and it just took off and I've lived in Thailand, I've mm -hmm. lived in England, I now live in America, in Chicago. Um, and I have always worked in the National Health Service um, in England. 
um, normally around the crisis intervention care. Mm -hmm. So if you have intensive care in physical health, we have the same in mental health. Um, it's called psychiatric intensive care. So I would work in the crisis service um, in the community deciding do people need to go into mm -hmm. um, intensive care mm -hmm. or are they safe in the community or not. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been really enjoyable. In yeah. Thailand, I spent time working with children who were sex trafficked oh, and supporting oh, them. Too bad. So yeah. that was, yeah, that was a year. Something I always wanted to do, but was incredible, but incredibly difficult at the mm -hmm. same time. And then, like you said, I moved to Chicago and opened up my own um, business doing mental health coaching and consulting. So I help one-on-ones and also companies and corporations just about um, learn about mental health, how to look after it, what it is, um, and then some different forms of therapies for those that need it. Mm -hmm. You have seen quite a lot of the world. That's great and very impressive. And Thank you. you have seen, I guess, difficult cases. Yes, uh, yes. And... I know in answer to your question about how it's changed during lockdown, it's changed significantly, actually, from lockdown. Um, so obviously, it's virtual now. Mm -hmm. So we're not seeing anybody face to face. And that has posed some challenges for me, which I think we'll probably talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, there's limitations around that, um, but also huge increases in, in anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so many people coming through and so many managers and companies come in, leaders coming to me saying, mm. I'm having six people a week calling yeah. me, having, you know, bur burning out, having meltdowns yeah. on Zoom and I don't yeah. know what to do. Um, so lots and lots of anxiety on a whole spectrum from children to, to managers to, um, yeah, to, and everybody in between. So, uh, all these people, managers, cool people show emotions. I understand correctly now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I what I try and do is when people come to me is is think about the what what can I do, but also being careful not to over medicalize. And mm -hmm. I really can't reiterate that enough. What has happened is is you know it's terrifying. It's new territory for pretty much the whole world. Mm -hmm. We've never been in this situation before in a lot of our lifetimes and people are having a whole variety of reactions and I try and get the message through that whatever you're feeling, that's okay mm -hmm. and it's just a snapshot and it, no feeling is final um, and there's no right or wrong way to feel right now because we're all in such new uncertain times. Um, so some people are, um, you know, kind of keeping to themselves, not going out, doing online shopping, you know, really staying isolated. And that's okay if that helps them feel safe. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people are kind of taking a bit of a different approach and going out and thinking, well, what will be, will be, and um, have different opinions on it. And that's okay too. You know, there's no, I don't think there's a right or wrong way of so a few people, So a few people, they want to enjoy life or forget maybe about the problems and other want to isolate and say, I keep it out. I won't stay safe. I don't see any, yeah. anyone. I don't, don't go to shops and all that stuff. So it's a very broad range, I guess. Or? It is, yeah. Yeah, and they're all coping techniques. And um, something that I think is really important to think about is that whatever we were doing before the pandemic um, to, to cope, a lot of that's been taken away. So even something just as small as seeing family, being mm. able to have a hug, you yeah. know, a hug really is oxytocin. It's the happiness yeah. hormone. Even those small things, let alone going out for dinner, going on holidays, having a break, getting a pedicure, getting your hair done, um, going to the gym, going to classes, you know, all the social outlets, they've all been stopped. So people's coping techniques have been stopped or That's significantly tragic, reduced. Tragic or in some way tragic. You are in a difficult position and some uh, hug of, a, of your yeah. uh, brother or sister, you can't have it, no? That's yeah. tragic in yeah. some way. Like the power of touch and, and as a, you know, somebody who works as a mental health professional, we do whole things on the power of mm -hmm. touch and how, mm -hmm. how therapeutic it can be and how helpful it can be. And so to not be allowed to do that, that is a huge thing just in itself. Mm -hmm. So when people are having these different ranges of emotions, I think they're just finding new ways of coping for the moment whilst their other kind of techniques and things they've done in the past might be taken away. So mm -hmm. it's all new. This feeling that the world is dangerous, does it, uh, you, you talked about anxiety and that the diagnosis of anxiety is increasing dramatically? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it, it really is. Because I think it's the uncertainty. No one knows what is happening and maybe what's going to happen. 
Um, I think it's fair to say that it's going to be, it is and it's going to be harder for some people to recover than others. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you think about the world as a dangerous place, that's that's our brains. Our brains are programmed to survive. They're mm-hmm. pre-wired. It's hardwired in us to survive. Mm-hmm. So our amygdalas are kind of in, in times of uncertainty are in overdrive, trying to keep us safe, trying to look out for potential threats. And when you have uncertainty, your brain almost plays out a disaster movie, mm-hmm. the worst case scenario, mm-hmm. because it's trying to keep you safe. Um so you can see why people's anxiety is increasing and why people are feeling the world might be dangerous because it, it's their amygdala. If you've got a very strong amygdala um, and the fight or flight res- response in the brain, you're going to you, you're going to have a heightened state of worry, distress, anxiety. That's the difficult and tragic and dramatic aspect we have at the moment. Our podcast is about the year 2023. What we will we see in two to three years uh, from now? Uh, is it um, just no, re- re- memory of three years ago? Like uh, three years ago, I had been in holiday in Thailand or I had a um, work, working engagement in Thailand. Or is it still present to the people or does it pop up? in a few years. Maybe you seem quite stable now, but maybe in two or three years it pops up. What yeah, do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think a- a- absolutely. Um, it, if you think about um, trauma, and trauma is anything where people experience a feeling of a loss of control. So it, it can be anything. And in this situation, that can cause people to feel trauma. I mean, for example, um, when the um, 9-11 terrorist attacks happened, people um, experienced PTSD just watching that on the mm-hmm. TV. They weren't even in America, they weren't experiencing it directly, but indirectly you can still experience trauma. So there's going to be a huge increase in PTSD mm-hmm. and those trauma experiences. And if it's left without kind of supervision, untreated, mm-hmm. um, which it kind of seems like it is at the moment from some of my friends that work in healthcare profession that have had to deal with, you know, for example, the story of Daniel, who's the doctor, Mm-hmm. Um, at the start of the Strange of the Future, you know, he he had some difficult choices to make and he's now got the um, remnants of that flashing back mm-hmm. and maybe some nightmares. That is very much what my colleagues are experiencing who are working in intensive care or on the front line who were pulled onto the front line mm-hmm. from their um, professions. And I think signs of trauma, um, for anybody who's listening to this and doesn't know much about it, you've got the kind of behavioral, which is agitation, irritability, hostility, hypervigilance, um, social isolation, and then psychological. So people tend to re-experience that trauma through intrusive, distressing recollections of the event. Mm. And that can be um, thoughts, um, nightmares, flashbacks. They're, they're unwanted. They come at certain times. Um And you can't control them when they come back. Also, your mood, guilt. So Daniel, in our scenario, he experiences a lot of guilt, um, loneliness, a loss of interest and pleasure in just activities you would normally enjoy, mm-hmm. insomnia, and then just emotional detachment, I think, is another big one for people to look out for. Yeah. If a person like David from our uh, little story from the beginning, the doctor who is, feels guilty about that he might have been performed better during the pandemic times and maybe have saved more lives or maybe in the end he has known some techniques he missed out in the beginning. If he comes to you, Sarah, what would Mm -hmm. you uh, maybe, what would be your intervention? What would you, what therapy would you start with someone like David? Wow. Yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, I think, I think it's about trying to help him understand that what he did was the best at that time. And he probably knows that, but around, I really enjoy a therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's not about getting rid of those unwanted feelings. People don't like feeling negative emotions or having these unwanted negative thoughts. Um, But the more you fight it, the more they come. It's almost like saying, don't don't look at that thing in the corner or don't think about that thing. You're gonna, you can't help but think about it. Um, so trying um, to get them to play through it. And I imagine with someone like Daniel, when he was in that situation, he didn't have the space and time to, to think 
about what was happening. You know, people talk about it, it's almost like a war zone and they're just going, mm-hmm. going, going. Um, so maybe because that was so unpleasant at the time, he's pushed it to one side and now he's thinking about what he should have done, but actually isn't thinking in a fair way. So I would probably spend some time going back into that trauma um, in a safe way, Mm -hmm. getting him to almost relive it, play through some of those times. Mm -hmm. Tell me an example Mm -hmm. when you think you could have saved that person and you didn't. And let's actually take you back to that place. Um, And it comes under a kind of like um, EMDR style therapy Mm -hmm. where you're getting them to re, they're reprocessing it. Um, uh, That's a technical expression. Maybe not everyone of our listeners understands. (laughs) Could you help out? So it's really huge in trauma and it's incredible how it works. And it's called eye movement desensitization. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, you, you basically, um, whatever the trauma is, you, you over time, obviously, because it, it, the person needs to feel safe and yeah. trust you, and you need to make sure that you can keep the uh, control of, of them. But you invite them to go back to that traumatic mm-hmm. experience. So if it was in a car and they were trapped, mm-hmm. um, or you know whatever the experience was, go back to it and replay it out. So for Daniel, in his experience, it could be there was a time when he was trying to save somebody, but he just had to walk away and let that person mm-hmm. go because there was somebody else coming through. And and so taking him back to that specific time and replaying it um, for everything that it was, and instead of feeling like he's not got control, actually inviting him to look around the room and what can he see and what are other people doing. Um, and then with the EMDR, what they do is they kind of use a, a system where you, you kind of put a thing in front of the eyes and you look left, right, left, right and follow it. And it kind of it helps. It's like a hypnotherapy, I guess, in a way, and mm-hmm. um, helps you go back to that time. So you're, you're completely there. You're in that moment. Maybe by moving the eyes, avoiding to feel stuck and frozen in these terrifying or uh, making you guilty situation. Do I understand correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I don't know a lot about it, um the you know the, the full details of it but i know mm. it, it it's something to do with the re- reprogramming basically it mm. reprograms and it allows a person to because when you're in a heightened state of arousal and you're in that kind of you know fight mm. or flight oh my gosh i've got all these people coming in i need to save them all what can i do um it helps you just go back to that time and really see a bit more than what perhaps you saw when your mm. brain was shut down and focusing on just survival and getting through it Does it help you to stay connected to your actual safe body, maybe, these uh, techniques? Yeah, so it's, and that's why it can't be rushed into, it needs to take time because that person needs to trust you because they are going back to a time that was very difficult for them. Um, So, uh, you know, they they can hear your voice and you can help ground Mm -hmm. them. So teaching them grounding techniques that they can stay, um, because they need to stay kind of present in one way, you know, kind of, you know, listen to my voice, I'm here, you're safe, it's okay, but also but go back to that time and what can you see and what can you smell and what can you feel and what's happening around you, what are the lights like, what's the temperature like. Um, but you're, you're kind of guiding them through it with your voice um, and with the kind of the presence that they, they, they know that they're safe overall. And it can take a, a bit of work, um, but it, it really, really helps. Sounds like an incredible technique you are telling us about uh, yeah of course this is uh, needs some very skilled uh, guidance do you think maybe for situations that are not so dramatic as the situations david is thinking about this can be done uh, on your own or is it too risky I think it, it, it depends. I mean, if, if there's something that was quite traumatic, but so for example, um, I was in an accident when I was in Thailand. I was mm. in like a, a motorcycle accident and, you know, it was quite traumatic as it would be. Um, and so I, that night when I went to bed and I knew I was in a safe space, I'm in bed, it's okay, I'm mm. safe, I'm done um, for the day, I can think. And I allowed the whole thing to come back to me and I replayed it from kind of the start to the end and I replayed it and replayed mm-hmm. it and I found myself doing that for a good few days whenever I was in a safe space just replaying the whole thing out mm-hmm. and how I felt and the noises I heard and um the pain and you know who was the first face mm-hmm. I saw and and just replaying it and 
perhaps that's because I've got a bit more insight already into mental health. Um, but I think that really helps. And you can sometimes find when something happens, you do replay it in your head just for a few days. And I think that's just you almost doing that naturally, like processing it mm. um, to come to terms with it. Very, very impressive what you are telling us. Very impressive. As we have different persons in the little story, David, I guess he is stressed. He has, of course, a problem, but I, I think he is not really ill. As, yeah. it, as you say, no over medication. Uh, it's in a way normal when you have such experiences that you think about it after a few years still. No? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Doctor wants to save lives. He wants to bring pe make people healthy and he doesn't want to see people dying in front of him and he's not able to help. But we have two other people. We have Anna. Uh, who is uh, maybe has lost the um, possibility to calibrate. No? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, and th this uh, sounds to me much more like a um, health issue than maybe David himself, as he uh, maybe he's a doctor and he will find some uh, help and super supervision and whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what yeah, about definitely. Anna and her, let's say, disorder of realizing what is a real uh, threat and what is maybe just uh, imagination? Yeah, so Anna is a really interesting one. And I think this is going to be something that mental health services see a lot more of and actually already are seeing a lot more of. Um, with And obviously there would be a lot more assessments and questions to find out what's going on. But when I read about her and the fact that she's perceiving the world as dangerous and she's avoiding things that could be perhaps kind of like social anxiety um, or some anxiety. But also in the back of my mind, I would be thinking about psychosis mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how, how much does she believe the world is unsafe? And what are those thoughts and feelings around the world being unsafe? Um, and I so... In, in psychosis services across mm. the, the world, I guess, um, they're seeing an increase in um, something called blips, which is brief, limited, intermittent psychotic symptoms. Um, so, and actually, it's really interesting because the same, a smaller increase in the UK when I was working and living there happened when a film called The Matrix mm -hmm, came out. Mm -hmm, I don't know if yeah, you've I know, seen it. I know, I remember, yeah. yeah. And so when that came out, we actually, as um, a kind of a service, saw an increase in these blips, um, these mm -hmm. kind of brief limited psychotic episodes where people had watched it and suddenly thought, am I living in a different world? Is there something going on? And it just triggered something inside them. And same with the film Inception. Actually, it happened again. There was an increase. And these things are already starting to go on the increase um, from coronavirus. They're seeing a more increase in not necessarily acute psychotic episodes, but people that are starting to show symptoms that they could be heading that way if there's no intervention. And I think that's really interesting. And so for Anna, I would be thinking about The, a psychosis mm -hmm. just querying that and making sure because that would be huge and, and that would be a big trigger I think mm -hmm. the yeah, whole coronavirus yeah. is going to trigger um, so, people who already have that vulnerability so, so maybe she has some uh, inclination to such a disorder maybe before corona and corona was the trigger yeah yeah Yeah. Or as well, if we think about how the um, longer term effect of kind of being in lockdown, the constant stress and uncertainty, and what it does to our brains, it does, as well as physical, um, it does affect you mentally. You know, it makes you more likely to be depressed, to be anxious, to think about OCD. You know, we're constantly being told to wash our hands and look out for these germs. And um, and I think you yeah, have people with that already that kind mm -hmm. of genetic mm -hmm. predisposition or vulnerability it's likely to tip people into a bit of a, a kind of psychosis where they have either strongly held fixed beliefs or delusions um, or actual, you know, psychosis, the world is dangerous, I'm not safe. Mm. Um, in your actual experience, do you notice that different social groups are different in a different um, hit by these problems First of all, I think of medical staff, 
of course, yeah. that are you are medical staff in some way that are yeah. really on the front line or at least in the hospitals seeing what's going on or doctors who have patients who go to hospital and, and, and so on and the people working in the, um, the medical doctors and, and general practitioners or other other um, groups in the society. Are there differences? You, you spoke about managers having meltdown on Zoom. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting. I found that um, so there's research from the Institute um, for Physical Studies suggests that an additional half a million people will have mental health problems as a mm -hmm. result of this pandemic. Um, and that the consequences for mental health like, could be like, an hour do looking to be absolutely profound. So I think that it's in our, in kind of in mental health forms, it's predicted to be the deepest and longest lasting in living memory. And um, I actually got some statistics from the last kind of past recession for the kind of 2008 global financial crash. Um, and the suicide rate in Europe went up 6.5% and it was three years before it started to go back down again. Mm. So I think it's going to hit everybody because the whole pandemic has hit everybody um so i kind of try to break it down to those who are already impacted mm. um you know there was a kind of a surge in mental health and more serious mental health needs i think we think who are a mental illness charity did a survey of 1500 people mm. um with serious mental illness and more than three quarters of respondents said that their mental health had got much worse in mm. april and may 2020 yeah, yeah. um And also people, you know, they were trying to make space for beds when this happened. And so those with already pre-existing mental illnesses who were perhaps already in hospital were kind of um, sent home because they were trying to make space for beds. And, you know, kind of if you think about where, where did these patients go yeah. and what, what happened to them? They must um, have felt very, let's say, lonely and... Uh given up in some way so yeah 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 <laughs> Go away. and if you've got if you've got people who are already suicidal oh. and hospitals are a safe place for them so sending them home bad. so bad. can make them feel like they're yeah they're not important or they're being that they're a, it reinforces that they feel they're a burden but then also if you think about it on the other side you know mental health patients tend to have um worse physical health diagnoses so illnesses like um, asthma, COPD on a busy inpatient ward, it's too risky. So, you know, sending them home can help them shield. But yeah, but then their mental health is, is paying a price for that. But you're right, there's, you know, there's pre-existing and there's the carers, there's the healthcare workers. Um, people, like, I think we spoke earlier about people have got a long wait list mm -hmm. to even get therapy. So once it's recognized, okay, yes, you have a mental health issue, we can help you but there's a six month wait list and the burden for that falls on the kind of carers supporting those people and they can burn out and then they have their own issues. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. huge. In the story, we are a little bit, let's say futuristic, uh, as we predict that, uh, even in mental health care, uh, online, um, sessions and online support might become more usual. I have yeah. even heard about um, mental health bots supporting, oh. supporting people by artificial intelligence that are uh, interacting with you and maybe analyzing what you are doing or what you are yeah. writing maybe sending signals to someone, oh, here is someone becoming more ill or it's deteriorating or, oh no, he's coping quite well. Uh, there is more time till he needs the next uh, personal intervention. Um, but let's just uh, talk about online. Online, you yeah. are doing, when I understood it well, you are doing yeah. now, or you did, you did where the, maybe the heavy uh, restriction time, you did online consultancies. Are you doing still yeah. online consultancies? Yeah, yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. 
And it, it's good in a way because it, it's actually opened up so I can help more people. I've got um, patients and clients now in um, India, in England. Um, so the, and that's good in a way because it makes me feel like I'm helping more people um, globally. Um, but yeah, I mean, the whole idea of online, I think it's got, in my opinion, I've got really mixed feelings about it. So I think having things done virtually is great, especially if you think about it from a pandemic point of view, because it helps stop that risk of spread and infection. And if you've got people that are saying, I don't really want you to come into my home mm -hmm, to give me mm -hmm. help, that, you know, it, it helps people access, um, you know, resources in that way who maybe don't want to leave or don't want people, you know, if, if me as a nurse, as a community nurse, I would see maybe four people or five people in a day, mm -hmm. they might not all want me to be going around after I've seen everybody else. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's um, a problem, yeah. It's more time as well, you know, you don't have to travel. Um, you've got more time to see more people, which I think is really helpful in terms of cost because everything comes down to cost. Um, reduced waiting times, which can then be helpful. Um, reduced barriers of people, you know, not wanting to walk into the um, big mental health mm -hmm. hospital yeah, yeah. Um, to go see a psychiatrist. Um, it's more accessible in some ways, but then in my opinion and perspective, like many people, especially on the further end of the spectrum with a serious mental illness, the ones um, with kind of psychosis, the suicidal mm -hmm. behaviors, um, those kind of things, they don't always have internet access. They, you know, they don't, yeah. they can't afford it or they don't have it or they don't have a space in the home where they can go to have a private confidential oh, conversation. Oh, you are so right. You are so right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, they, but sometimes you just think about it. Yes, yes. They don't have an yeah. internet access. They don't have a safe space where they can talk uh, without hearing other people running without, around. Yeah, where they oh, feel yeah, comfortable. You are so right. You are so right. And yeah. And also kind of for people with psychosis, um, which I think we're going to see a rise in psychosis and suicide and OCD. Um, people with psychosis, they're already quite paranoid and suspicious. Um, and so having to talk, they, a lot of them don't like technology because they don't trust it or they think there's videos and cameras and people are recording them. And so it's actually, for me, I think it helped. It's great for a small window on the spectrum of mental illness, mm -hmm. but for the further end of the spectrum, It's, it's making it harder because it's cutting it off. It's creating big barriers that I don't know that you can overcome. For those that are really unwell that don't even think they're unwell, they're mm -hmm. not going to log in for a session with you every week mm -hmm. because they think they're fine. So why would they? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, it, it relies on a, an element of insight that people understand they're not well and that they're willing to, you know, kind of engage and um, what's the word, kind of be... Um, in innovative and uh, proactive mm -hmm. in their recovery. So maybe it's more for a support, an additional possibility, maybe for people who are not so dramatically affected, who want to have some support, who are maybe not ill, but say, ah, oh, I still have some nightmares and I don't feel that way. I would have a little bit talking to someone professional who can give me ideas and who can support me. So maybe for that small group, it might be an additional uh, possibility to work on these problems. Yeah, yeah, I think for a small, it, it could. And I have been doing work with people that way. And I think that, you know, that's, that's fine and that feels okay. But as soon as they start to say to me that they are feeling suicidal or yeah, anything yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. It, yeah, it changes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really more dramatic than I thought, uh, especially when you are talking about suicides and rate of suicide and burnout and meltdown and all that stuff. If you would like to draw um, a summary or make a summary of your ideas, what would you say should our listeners keep in mind from this uh, post-traumatic stress ideas? What, what are, in your opinion, the important points? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm a big advocate for self-compassion. And people don't always like to do it because they think it's narcissistic or you know it's uncomfortable for people to do. But I think it's so important. And I always try and use the analogy of 
people that um, you would never, you know, you would never speak to anybody as much as you speak to yourself. Um, so be, you know, speak to yourself like you're a friend. Be careful how you're speaking to yourself. Watch how you're speaking to yourself, um, and allowing those feelings to to come and go as they need to. It's unrealistic to think you'll always be okay and you'll always be happy. If if you're, I mean, I, I honestly, some days since the pandemic, um, have just laid in bed for the mm. for a few hours and had a cry if I needed to, and mm. and that's okay. Feel what I need to feel because that's okay. Mm. Um, you know, you won't always be ha- happy. You need a full range of emotions and that's life. And it kind of makes me think of resilience. And there's a really great talk on resilience um, on TED Talks. Mm-hmm. But it kind of basically talks about how accepting that hu- suffering is part of the human existence. Mm-hmm. So those that are saying, oh, why me? And that kind of thing, like um, they're going to find it harder to cope. Yeah. Um also, people are really good at selecting their attention. So resilient people are really, really good at focusing on the positives and gratitude, having gratitude. And something that the coronavirus has taught me is, is to have gratitude. Mm. Um, I think there was a study in 2005 by a gentleman called Seligman that said that um, if people, the, the people that thought of three good things a day um, had an increase in gratitude, an increase in happiness, and a decrease in depression levels. Oh, great, so great. I try and end my By day. By the way, Sarah, things. if you have a few links for material maybe useful for our listeners to read through okay. or to flip through, uh, we would be very happy to include it to our transcript or to in our blogs. As I okay. guess, um, in the end, more people are... Um, struggling. <laughs> yeah, I'm yes. happy to find some some beside your uh, voice, which is very yeah. helpful. <laughs> Maybe yes. to, some people like to read uh, through a few uh, helpful uh, articles. So you say, be grateful. Anything yeah. else uh, you think is important in the context of this issue? I would I would just say asking yourself is what I'm doing or thinking helping me or harming me? And that Mm -hmm. can be really powerful. Um, So I would kind of end with that one. Yeah, just as you're doing things, is this helping me or harming me? Mm -hmm. In the end, I always ask my guests, you personally, uh, is there's something you will, you have changed during uh, the restrictions and during the pandemic what you want to keep where you say, okay, 2023, I will still. Yeah, I think it's got to be gratitude. Um, it's just, it's, it's something I've never thought of. I've always taken everything for granted. I'm very lucky. I've had a really great life. Everything's come easy for me. And this is the first time I've, I've actually realized how blessed I am to have that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, kind of gratitude, um, for everything so there was a point where people were really struggling especially with children and I suggested that um, some people I was working with they wrote down things they wanted to do in a jar and put them and put these things in a jar and I actually did it myself and just put in things like I'm going for a glass of wine with a friend or going to see your grandma or mm-hmm. going for a walk in the park or mm-hmm. going for a bike ride all those things that you would normally take for granted that you can't do right now that when you can then do again mm-hmm. in that just remembering that there was a time when you couldn't and how much that meant to you mm-hmm. and not taking those small things for granted. Ah, I think it's okay, important to take. Okay, okay. The yeah. char technique. Yeah. Typically by the word char, I would think about whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah, everybody's got their own. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I could talk to you hours for hours, Sarah. Hi. Maybe we should make an appointment uh, in a few months or half a year or a year to talk how it went on and what yeah, the next going. steps of the pandemic had been as, uh, uh, yeah, it it is not over yet. It is not no. over yet. And so I wish you very, very well. Keep as that- happy and yeah. joyful as you are today. And Thank you. Uh, give all the pleasure and all the blessing to your patients that they will come healthy and safe through these difficult times, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. I know they will. I always have hope. 
Mm. I don't think anybody is a lost cause anywhere. But thank you so much for having yeah. me. It was a pleasure to speak with you. And thank you to the listeners for listening to me. Um, and I'll, I'll send over some resources as well that people might find helpful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. You've been listening to 2023. To get in touch with us with your comments or ideas, or if you'd like to be a guest on the show, just email hello at 20-23.earth. You can find even more material, including transcripts of our interviews, on our website at 20-23.earth. Please keep in mind, the content of this podcast is our opinion. We work hard to get our facts right. However, if you find something that can be corrected or improved, please email us at hello at 20-23.earth. If you haven't already done so, We'd be grateful if you would subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you happen to listen. Thanks for listening, stay safe, and there will be springtime in 2023.